here. Uh, and uh, so we have a little bit more time. And I always like to give a chance, if I'm the one presenting or managing that uh, in this kind of event, I like to give us a little chance to be more of a community with this than just I'm the one who's yakking and you're the ones who are listening. So the whole notion of a club, this is formerly a club. It's called the Uranian Cyclonic Club, which is a fancy way of talking about folks getting together, as Roger was explaining, folks getting together around trying to be psychologically minded. What does it mean to gain psychological literacy, which is related to emotional literacy? We're, we're raising an emotionally illiterate culture. Most cultures have an emotional literacy. Ours is illiterate, meaning there's out to lunch. Uh, but it's terrible injustice on that account. How can we deal with all that? So uh, these are passionate issues at stake, ultimately, in terms of feelings. And first, I equate that with things like shamanism. As in my experience, you know, the shame goes into a trance and stuff. It's a, it has to do with these passionate states of being, and being homosexual. Being passionate, I knew being homosexual around sex. But now I'm getting in I'm saying, imagine that passion that comes to you around if you get if, if you get homosexual interest, but now you want to follow it up literally. But now you hold off on the literal, not for the sake of being a monk or dad and being really celibate, so you just defer the literal. I'm talking about you you still try and feel it, but without making it literal, but instead of making it literal, you try and go to its source as if you were connecting with the person from which the passion came inside of you. So this is about loving aspects of oneself, but it's not narcissism I'm talking about, which is self-love of a sterile kind, and different than what I'm talking about. Though in a broader sense, it is a kind of self-love, but more in the sense of acceptance. But here are deeper levels of self-acceptance. How to practice that, not just talk about it. Anyone can talk. I learned this long ago, of course. Anyone can talk about anything, and can say anything, in any way they want, and often do. But the meaning of the actual words versus what it seems like may be very different. And often are, and usually are. So to me, when I was getting shamanic and overtly that way, it was a way of getting out of that hypocrisy, it seemed to me at the time, of working with that puzzle. I hope perhaps how I've shared this evening has conveyed a little bit of that. I thought for a long time, I puzzled over for a long time, how I could share some of the essay in a way that can convey the feeling of that time to you. Because now historically it's all gone. Almost all the people that, that I would otherwise have reference in the story I told you tonight are all dead. All of them, almost all of them, are dead. Yeah, if it wasn't from suicide, and I'm quite serious about it, and other things of that nature, it was from AIDS. Or from age, in the case of Harry, he's dead from sheer age. And John, his lover, was dead too from age. He was, uh, what, 89, 91 when he died. Harry was well in those 90s, about 93 when he died. Tch, that's a long time. Arthur. Now, Arthur just recently died, yes. Don Clark. Don Clark is just barely hanging in there. He's an old codger now. He's in his, what, 70s, isn't he? 70s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was talking about him in the furs of Don. Don was brought in because he was a great organizer. He founded, he co-founded the, the uh, LA Center uh, with Morris Kite. And he, Don was the first executive director for the first seven years of the center. He was the executive director. So and Harry and I wanted, Harry kept saying to me, I want to make what we're doing between you and I into this whole movement with a bunch of people. I always, I always taking the position of no, it's not time. So he's always the one encouraging and suggesting it. And I was the one saying, no, I don't, I think it's too, too ahead of the curve. It's too much. It won't get a, uh, it won't get a, a, a fix. It won't sit into the situation and it'll be successful. Uh, but then eventually that changed, and I felt a change. And I told him it changed. And then he said, oh, well, we can't just do it ourselves. That's when we became interested in looking around. He said, oh, there's this guy coming through, Don Kilhefner. And he met Don, and he thought, well, Don is amazing around organizing. He knows all these ways, and he's amazing capacity around being able to handle this kind of stuff. He can help us actually get it happen. A lot of things that Don has more recently written about, a lot of things he actually did, and he was brought on board for those things, to actually go out to these different possible places to have our first meeting, and actually scout the land and set things up, and coordinate all the physical stuff and all that, was his job. 
He claims that was the only thing, it was the main thing going on, it was the last thing going on. Because the thing would have no substance without the substance of it and all that. It wouldn't have been for the people who went there and made it a big deal. Just because of their experiences. Not because of them, these outer things, and that's the outer things that become history. We remember things because they move people, but we don't remember them moving. Because we have to have a new experience. If they had an experience, it only exists in experience. And our experience is now. Ah, now we get to those interesting cuts. Like, when can we remember that? That's as revolutionary now as it was back then. I can live now that way as I did back then. On this level, I still continue that. As radical as ever. Worse than ever now, because I've seen that it's even more interesting than trying to broadcast these notions, like I'm doing this evening, I'm doing this for a historical record. Uh, but more interesting than this is a more serious training program that our institute has uh, set up. And what will come of that? And moving that way, and that's the trend of this throughout the last two generations, ever since I started with Area in 1976. Almost two generations. It is hard to face one psychology, and especially when it's a homosexual situation. Because we have a thousand years of hatred against homosexuality, and we have all this bias against being introverted, and all this bias against being an individual. In spite of all everyone's saying, our whole culture saying, we're going to be an individual. It's a most hypocritical of societies, while at the same time being so modern. I understand why I actually gives birth to this criticism of modernism, postmodernism now. It's a branch of modernism. It's a criticism of the so called advances, like all the Republicans, like all the Republicans, <laughs> and the Democrats. It's one party rules us, like China has always ruled us, one party. But they're factions within the rich. They're factions within the powerful. Okay, so enough of that one. So, okay, I hope this shares some of what it was like, uh, how it's, uh, even I've gotten a little bit of the continuity of this, how it still, uh, 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 it all was in spite of the exotic qualities back then, uh, so I was in this whole ultimate world, not like it is now, we're more integrated with uh, uh, the way uh, the one just power wants to continue. Back then, people felt that uh, the only way was to overtly fight against unjust power. But the real secret was the unjust power was within the individual. And the organizing has to start even more fun now. It's brave, and I, I participate still in outer <laughs> organizing, outer ways of contributing and stuff, and I encourage everyone to do that. In my opinion, it's not enough. It won't be enough. It won't be enough. And, the, and humans will extinguish themselves. And our being human means being introvert, not extrovert. As much as we're born in bodies and born in the world. And I'm not talking like a, like a, like a, a Christian anchorite who's separated from the body and the spirit. But we are human beings. No other creature is this has this duty, I don't want to call it, because I don't want to sound like a shaming thing. This is a really humongous challenge when, we, when a being becomes self-conscious. It doesn't want to be self-conscious. That's our species. We are the species that is self-conscious and doesn't want to be. Even though we all say we want to be. We really act like we don't want to be. <coughs> and it was a dilemma when I was coming up as a younger person, it's a dilemma now. And it will only get more intense until there are no more people and we've extinguished life on the planet or people get it. So in my opinion, there's no other way to seriously tackle this. In other words, the level where I'm talking like this, this level to you is futile. I'm just doing it again for the record and stuff like that. It's good to say it every now and then anyway. But it has no consequence. It's nice. And I hope it, it, it's, it's appreciated as valuable. But it doesn't matter what I said or don't say. It makes no difference. In terms of the issue, I mean the problem of uh, destruction of the planet. <clears throat> but this way of efforting, you know, encouraging the practice of partnering uh, the experience of one's experiments. And I find only a psychological understanding can be useful at doing that. And only uh, one that's very specifically able to get at the important levels of trauma and transpersonal possibility. That means the psychoanalytic understanding and emotion based psychoanalytic understanding and a Jungian understanding, but all under the purview of a pro gay attitude. And to implement that is what I'm talking about doing, not talking about it. It's very hard to actually implement these things. Easy, easy, easy to talk about any of these things. Any of you know, of course, who seriously tried to partner in psychology. 
personal support. Okay, this is funny enough, I'm sorry. I am sure, uh, I hope, uh, folks are having reactions. And feelings, I want to invite that, whatever it is, whatever you happen to be feeling and experiencing. And that's as much a part of the experience of being here this evening as whatever I've said or not said, whatever I've been or not been while well, up here. Uh, and here I've even gone on longer. Thank you very much for your patience, but uh, 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 I want to make sure we get a chance to invite you also, if you have some comments or questions or feedback for me, you still have a few minutes left. Uh, not a whole lot of time, but I'd like to give uh, a few of you opportunity if any of you might like to react a little bit. Uh, so it's not just me speaking up here, uh, because uh, it's easy for me to fill the time anyway if no one says anything. So I gotta watch that one too. So I'm wondering, I'm sure there have been a variety of strong reactions of various sorts. And I'm gonna invite you all to stay with those reactions over the next days, whatever they are. But might anyone be feeling in any way pulled to share some emotion right now? Or to comment in some way to ask a question or something like that? We have a few more minutes left before I have to turn it back over to Roger uh, and end this uh, uh, historical uh, uh, recreation and moment of experience here. Take the moment of experience, but uh, might someone have anything? Yeah. Uh, okay, if you could say your name first. Uh, oh, first name. David. Burning question after mm. these uh, works were published, a group of gay men back then mm. try to enact it or follow it? Excellent question, David. An excellent yeah. question. Yes, that's, that's what happened is that there were a group of men who were more or less associated with the fairy movement. Mm. So these essays were written and more or less they started out. Uh, the first essay was written while I was being introduced to and beginning to correspond with Harry Hay. In the beginning part of 1976. And that was the time when I was being in my search for trying to figure out this different word for the spirit of being gay. And I remember when the first things I wrote to him was a query asking him what his opinions were about my interest and what he what if anything he had thought about that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, so uh, 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 that's what started out that kind of interest and and with John as well, and he had a group of people he was associated with, but they didn't want to get more serious. And he didn't even want to get more serious. This is people he knew in New Mexico where he lived. He had a circle of loving companions. Even at his level of talking about gay centeredness, which had nothing psycholo overtly psychological about it, these other people that he was associated with, and he was trying to organize in a gay way, and over, as well as other ways he was an organizer back then with Indians and other people. Uh, he, they didn't even grasp that, folks. That's why he was very discontented at the time I approached him uh, after hearing about him. It was an odd experience itself. I heard about him. I heard that story too, as well. I was in the Arthur Evans lecture. And just when a friend of his I said, You're weird, just like Harry. You should meet him. He lived in New Mexico. I heard in New Mexico. That's how I met him. That's how I met Harry. And that's when I first started to work with him. And then I found that, you know, uh, one step led to the next with Harry, and pretty soon we were associating because it was shocking how much close he was to what he grasped about that gay, kind of gay centered psychology without it all being psychological. Uh, and then associating with him until we got to the point where his interest in me was a mass thing. So I don't know if it's his background or whatever, always thinking in extrovert terms about all this stuff, no matter that I was not an extrovert. He was, uh, and eventually uh, uh, his, his push on me got a response back from me and said, yes, we should do that. Uh, and so, lo and behold, uh, we bring on someone to help us actually put it together and, and begin this literalistic with us, Don Hefner. He came on board in, in middle of 1978, and we firmed up our association at the end of 1978. So we put on the first gathering in the summer of 1979. Uh, we got way more than what we expected, okay? Uh, and that began a community affair. Okay, so, but already I'm getting into these difficulties and discomforts and issues with Harry where he doesn't want to be psychologically minded, but from my earlier training, I'm trying to be psychologically minded. So already this dispute is familiar to everyone. It's not hidden and not secret, at least from my point of view. But it's not bringing about more participation and more involvement in something more serious about like what I was doing myself personally. And I could see not only, not only was Harry showing an epitome of an oppositional attitude, everyone was resistant, only very slowly. So it was like more like over the years here and there, I remained consistent, though the style or level of what I was saying and doing and being might evolve. There was a consistency in it. 
So the time say starting with when I was associated with Chris. And then there were other fairies, people involved with the fairy scenes, or involved with the fairy scene, but then simultaneously gradually also involved with the psyche.